This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of July 28th, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 353. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And on the big deal feature, the 33rd Summer Olympics are on in Paris. Now a third time host of the Five Ring Circus. We will find out if the French learned anything about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the games that came before, such as the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. The Winter Games are not returning to Vancouver, instead the French Alps in 2030 and Salt Lake City in 2034. This week, an encore presentation of my February interview with Erwin Ostindi of Vore Urban Labs. Erwin was in the French capital in February to meet with academics and critics of Paris 2024 to share his knowledge about Vancouver 2010 and its socioeconomic goals. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. The Paris 2024 Olympics are coming in July. It'll be the 100th anniversary of the second Paris Olympics. On February 12th, it was the 14th anniversary of the opening of the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. These mega events come at a great cost, as Vancouverites know, leaving legacies that are good, bad, and ugly. My guest on this week's edition is Erwin Ostindi of Vore Urban Labs and Simon Fraser University, who recently returned from Paris. Uh, Erwin, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Uh, tell us about the project that you're working on, inhabiting the mega eventful city. Good to be with you, Bob. Um, and it's it's nice to talk about these issues and have a, a longitudinal lens at, uh, and, and think about what happened in Vancouver in 2010 and the lead up and then looking at what's happening this year in Paris and then you know, future mega events that are coming down the down the pipe. Uh, yeah, so I was invited by um, Melora Kupke and Nick Blomley uh, from SFU. They're uh, in the geography department. And they are looking at the question of impacts on the inner city and looking at Paris and spe- specifically and partnering with an organization, a coalition of uh, Paris groups called La, Re- La Revere de la Médaille. It's basically like the flip side of the coin or the other side of the coin. It's a very clever... Uh, name, and they're looking at those unspoken or maybe uh, invisible impacts from from the games in Paris. And of course, uh, it's coming fast in Paris. There's a massive amount of homelessness in Paris. And so they're concerned about uh, the the impacts on the migrants, the homeless population, the homeless youth, and wanted to learn from what's happening in Vancouver. So this academic project brings people who uh, understand this issue from a from a, sl- a street level in Vancouver and a street level in Paris, and then they invited me in because uh, I was involved back in the day in Vancouver, trying to uh, working with folks like Jim Green and Am Joe Hall and others with the impacts on um, the the ICI and the impacts on Community Coalition, trying to make sure that the Olympics wasn't just a, a good thing for Olympic sponsors but a good thing for the public uh, in Vancouver as well. The ICI is the Inner City Inclusivity Statement, a groundbreaking strategy by the Vancouver bid team. It was supposed to help lessen the negative impacts of the Olympics on Vancouver's downtown east side, Canada's poorest postal code. It was supposed to result in opportunities for people to better their lives. It contained promises about accessibility, affordability, housing, jobs, civil liberties, and public safety. But the Great Recession of 2008-2009 led to several high-profile Olympic sponsor bankruptcies, and some of the biggest promises fell by the wayside. There were a lot of cutbacks, and they decided to basically shelve a lot of the promises they made. 
And I remember mm -hmm. uh, some of the IOC executives, we in the media asked them about it in the months before the Olympics. And they said, well, that was aspirational. We're going to do our best. But that was that was merely aspirational. That was uh, not part of the host city contract per se. It was uh, part of the bid, uh, but we're not going to enforce it if, if it doesn't come true. We've, we've got games to organize and games to hold and, and broadcasters uh, who need content um, and athletes who need to compete. So it, it became uh, less and less of a priority as the games approached. Yeah, and I think, and, and, and it's important to think about this from a historical lesson because this is at a time when Mayor Philip Owen uh, from the NPA party at the time was really learning about as a as a as a mayor for the public for all the public in Vancouver learning about the health impacts of overdose and uh, and drug supply issues back back in Vancouver with people uh, dying from uh, unsafe fixing sites so that at that time the, in the lead up to the games and the writing of the ICI the whole question around the four pillars approach to um, the public health crisis that was the drug addiction issue in Vancouver the homelessness issue; these issues were were not topics that a, a conservative politician was embracing. And it, it ironically, mega events were not a topic that uh, social democrat NDP affiliated politicians would embrace. And so, ironically, that that time in two thousand two, you you see Jim Green uh, on the left, and you see uh, Philip Owen on the right, actually find common ground uh, to cooperate on both the Olympics, the four pillars, and these broader issues. So. It was an interesting time in history. It's important to think about that context. Uh, but to your point, Bob, you're 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 correct that um, it really became uh, from um, the it's in, in the the start of it was a really historic opportunity to uh, take pride in the fact that this was the first time that a, a social clause was part of the bid. Um, it went in the the city manager um, who was my boss at the time, Judy Rogers. She was uh, in charge of the bid, and she. Uh, um, you know, did did the good thing by putting in these 37 commitments. It was the first time in history that three levels of government and the IOC accepted this as part of the bid. The problem was, partly it's what you're saying around funding issues, and we maybe we can get to that issue around um, the way that that bid, the way that the games hid, hid the cost, and that became the kind of dominant message and the dominant objectives of the bid organizers, the, uh, the Olympic organizers, was to hide those true costs across different government ministries, uh, and a lot of obfuscation techniques, uh, and we'll get back to that obfuscation. But really, it went from a really beautiful idea of inclusion, uh, and there was a plebiscite, again, another historic thing that happened in Vancouver. Um, we got the Woodward's development as a result of the bid. So all these things happened, but to your point, the, the follow-through wasn't there, and there was a lack of uh, direct responsibility for the impl implementation. And it wasn't that the community wasn't concerned, it was that the community really got used for that bid phase to get buy-in, and then it was abandoned. And I think you know maybe at best three out of the thirty-seven commitments were followed through on. So a real sense of betrayal, and it shows to me in a longitudinal way that you know as a social science person, you can write great policy, but it's not about the good policy. It's really about the implementation. It's about the oversight, the metrics. You know how do you know when you're being successful? So those no one was really championing that. No one took responsibility for that, and. Uh, here, here we were. We uh, we lost. There was a net loss in housing, and most famously, the uh, the Olympic Village here. I'm just looking out my window here at Olympic Village. The Olympic Village uh, housing really went to the market because at that time, later on, two years after the games, with those delays and the housing costs, the Olympic organizers decided to sell more housing on the market rather than follow through on all the commitments to to the social housing uh, legacy. So. Betrayal, learned lessons, uh, and those are some things that we could share with folks in Paris who are facing extreme levels of housing pressures. Uh, they have massive supply in Airbnbs. Uh, they've got um, uh, migrant youth and children um, and uh, living on the streets. And uh, so they're looking at uh, 25,000 furnished apartments being used on Airbnb while there's a massive housing crisis in Paris. So lessons to be learned and shared between Paris and Vancouver. What, what else did you uh, see here and uh, learn in Paris while you were there? Well, we saw uh, very firsthand the experience of the 
I would say the kind of carceral or the punitive way that the Paris government um, and and French authorities in general treat migrants. And there's this there's this illusion that the hordes are coming from Africa or the Middle East to France. Most migrants, I think 97% of migrants actually don't go to France. They don't go to Europe. They go to other countries in Africa or they go to other countries in the Middle East. Um, admittedly, there are pressures on social services. And so the question really becomes, um, are priorities to house homeless people, are their priorities to support workers providing services in the service sector, et cetera? Is that a priority for society? And it's clearly not in France. It's clearly not in Paris because the investment, billions of dollars of investment in a mega event comes at the same time as these opportunity to build systems such as shelter systems, um, infrastructure to support migrant youth. You know, we, we, we see migrant youth in Paris with zero rights. They can't go to school. They can't access food and shelter um, until they prove to the courts that they are are a youth. So it's a very difficult punitive space. And at the same time, Paris is this beautiful global tourist destination. So it's a social policy problem that really, unfortunately, doesn't find common ground. And so the organization in, in France, uh, the other side of the medal, the flip side of the coin, um, La Revere de la Médaille, they're really bringing a big tent uh, process to this. They brought in dozens of social, social service organizations that do great frontline work. And they're uniting to say, actually, I don't think we're ready, Paris. I don't think we're ready for the games in five months. Let's tackle this now. Let's not just talk about social inclusion. The Paris games are using the same narrative, Bob, as Vancouver did. The most socially inclusive games ever. And so we're able to talk about, uh, and we had a big press conference in France with about 25 um, um, journal, um, members of the media, radio, television, uh, print press, all really excited about learning what we've learned from Vancouver and was it applicable to France. So uh, it was uh, an important sharing of knowledge of the practical implications. When you've got, for example, in Vancouver, you've got the mega investment of public dollars. And at the same time, British Columbia for nine years in a row was leading the country in child poverty. That was happening at the same time. And so for me as a, as a urban planner, someone interested in social policy, that for me represents a disconnect. And it says public dollars are being spent on this objective. Who makes that decision that those objectives, subsidizing mega events, the billion dollars in security costs, that that's more important for a short-term impact than it is to do long-term uh, uh, social policy. And uh, you know, it's important that the public is engaged in these conversations. And uh, you know, I'm grateful for you, Bob, you know, the fact that you prioritize these issues, there's not a lot of journalists in Vancouver that, you know, prioritize this, this issue of mega events and the impact on our cities, because it's a huge type of cor corporate welfare. You know, there, there's big co corporations and there's the FIFA World Cup and there's the Olympics that extract a lot of wealth from our cities. But do we actually get the net benefit? Does Vancouver and does Paris actually need the, t the investment to attract tourists? Arguably not, but we seem to be addicted in to these mega events. The legacies of Vancouver 2010 include socio-economic upheaval. The poor got poorer and the rich got richer. In 2016, six years after Vancouver hosted the Games, BC's chief public health officer declared an opioid overdose public health emergency. Money laundering was fueling the red-hot real estate, luxury car and casino industries. Empty houses abounded. Meanwhile, poor people and addicts resorted to camping in parks or old recreational vehicles. By the 10th anniversary of the Games, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. A lot of the lessons that were supposed to be learned for 2010, that was that were supposed to be part of the plans for 2010, seemed to have been forgotten after the circus went home. Yeah, and there's a there's an institute in, in Geneva, Switzerland, the Center on Housing Rights and Evictions, and they wrote a report about Vancouver. And it's really, really clear. It's ir irrefutable that the link between mega events and, and negative housing impacts. It's very clear. It's very consistent. You just track it all through the game. So these are not mysteries, but we seem to be seduced by the, the allure of maybe some kind of insecurity. We need these mega events to come into our city. But time and time again, it shows that really these mega events to just stay in one city, keep it there, build the infrastructure, leave it there. Um, but bouncing around the planet, um, extracting taxpayer dollars to fund 
you, you think about the FIFA, I don't know, Bob, how much FIFA makes every year, but they make lots of money and it's often through public subsidy. So, you know, I, I don't know. I thought we got, got away from the old uh, monarchy uh, where we pay these taxes to, to the, to the feudal landlord, but it seems these mega events continue to this, this tradition of, of feudalism when it comes to tax dollars. As much as the Olympics are supposed to be about uniting the world's best athletes together for peaceful competition, they are also the world's biggest real estate and tourism promotion. Another mega event is coming to town. Seven matches in the 2026 FIFA World Cup are coming to BC Place Stadium. Seattle and Toronto are also among the 16 host cities. It's costing Vancouver taxpayers at least $230 million, we don't know how much BC Place renovations will cost or security. There could be a, a cost at the end of the day of a billion dollars to hold this in Vancouver and Toronto combined, if not more. Uh, now, your, yeah. your company uh, is also looking at uh, the impacts of 2026 and the opportunities for 2026 for FIFA host cities. Uh, talk, talk about what you're doing there. It, it's interesting to look at um, at the P&E site because it's it's you know it's possible that the city could actually make money on the P&E site if they built that after they build that infrastructure, but again lack of transparency and and when you see Montreal back out of this, yes man, Montreal has its own legacy from 1976, but Montreal was like I don't think we're going to go forward. I don't think there's public consensus to go forward, but Vancouver maybe a younger culture, younger political culture. It's a wild west out here, so uh, Vancouver's all in. Um, our, our company, uh, is doing research and, uh, building a network between the host cities in the, in the 16 host cities for FIFA world cup, 2026, there's an incredible opportunity to share lessons and support social policy, um, and really leverage let's, let's face it, the, 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 the games are coming to Paris. And so the organizations in Paris, La Revere de la Medaille, they're coming together on a very pragmatic basis saying. It's happening. Let's not be fooled. Let's build some infrastructure as quickly as possible. Same thing with 2026. There's these 16 cities, Vancouver and Toronto, two of them. Let's not be fooled. Let's learn from our lessons. And let's ensure that there's some level of accountability. We, we learned that the, the ICI statement uh, from Impact on Community Coalition from back in 2002, that was official part of the bid book for the Olympics and became a, uh, an under-delivered outcome from the Olympics, was was ripe with social washing. And so we understand the role of communications, we understand the role of deception in media, and we know how governments can deceive the public, deceive the taxpayers to say, it's all gonna be great, we've got it under control, but then there's slippage, there's cost overruns. So we know this is a pattern and we can do good, um, we can build in systems of accountability and, and sharing between these host cities to say, Actually, this is this is the report card from 2025. This is the report card from uh, winter of 2026. This is a report card leading up to the games. We can actually hold uh, these host cities accountable so that we're not, again, just deceiving the public and extracting uh, wealth from from the taxpayers. And it's all extracted to FIFA, which is, you know, making billions of dollars. After the Paris Olympics this summer, the world will turn its eyes to the U.S., Canada and Mexico for the 2026 World Cup. The biggest, most complex World Cup ever, with 48 nations in 16 cities. But before then, in the fall of 2025, the Vancouver 2010 Olympics board and finance files will finally be open at the Vancouver Archives. So that, that's been one of the hallmarks of uh, mega events, is the lack of transparency. The Olympic Organizing Committee in Vancouver was not covered by the Freedom of Information Law. After the Games, the Auditor General did not do a... Uh, a, an audit of the organizing committee. Uh, we still have so many questions about the cost, and uh, we have questions now about the relationship between our public bodies and FIFA as we go forward into 2026. Well, thanks for your persistent journalism on this as well, Bob, and and your authorship of the book on the Vancouver Games that we can all learn from, because we can look back at, at what actually happened, and you documented that. So kudos to you for doing this work as well. Jerwin Dandy from... Uh, uh, Vor Urban Labs and Simon Fraser University, uh, recently back from uh, Paris, which is hosting the Olympics this summer, and a project called Inhabiting the Mega Eventful City. And uh, look forward to uh, keeping in touch with you as uh, things get closer to both Paris 2024 and also the 2026 World Cup, looking at uh, the issues of importance, not just what goes on in the stadium, 
but what happens in our neighborhoods and what happens to our pocketbooks too. Thanks again for joining Thanks. us. Thanks, Bob. You know, one of the biggest takeaways I have is that, uh, is I guess to the extent to which it's part of the culture globally um, to employ tactics that, you know, might be in the ethical gray area in order to gain an edge. Um, you know, I've seen in, in four months, I've seen quite a lot of this. Um, but despite this uh, global context, I want to make something very, very clear. Um, behavior in the ethical gray area is completely unacceptable to Canadians. Uh, it's completely unacceptable to Canada soccer and our organization. And frankly, to me personally, it's completely unacceptable as the leader, as the leader of the organization. That's the sound of Kevin Blue, the CEO of the Canadian Soccer Association during a July 26th Zoom conference with reporters before the Paris 2024 Olympics opening ceremony. The Canadian women's Olympic soccer team, defending gold medal champions from Tokyo, dominated world sport news before the Paris 2024 opening ceremony. Police caught staff from the Canadian team using a drone to spy on New Zealand's training sessions. Coach Bev Priestman, assistant coach Jasmine Mander, and analyst Joseph Lombardi were all sent home. The IOC, FIFA, and the Canadian Soccer Association are all investigating. But could this impact Canada's co-hosting of the Men's World Cup in less than two years, 2026, in Vancouver and Toronto? FIFA has disqualified national teams before. In fact, it suspended all of Mexico's national teams for two years. Joining me to talk about that scandal and the ripple effects is Mario Canseco, who's normally a frequent guest on the Breaker.News for his polling with Research Co. But Mario is originally from Mexico and one of the biggest soccer fans and experts in Vancouver. And Mario, wonder if you can go back in history about this scandal that uh, really was a turning point for Mexican soccer. Well, what happened was uh, in 1988, uh, reporters uh, for television were able to look into a specific catalog that was published by the Mexican Soccer Federation. And the uh, ages of at least four players did not match uh, when you factored in that they played in an under 23 tournament. Uh, long story short, uh, FIFA gets involved. They try to figure out how they can punish Mexico. And the the way in which people felt about it is, you know, Mexico's always been a friend of FIFA. Uh, it had just organized the 1986 World Cup after, after Colombia pulled out. Um, there was a sense. And at the time, the CONCACAF president was also from Mexico. So the thought was, we'll just get by with a slap in the wrist. Nothing is... Uh, going to be taken too seriously, but FIFA really did take it seriously and ended up suspending Mexico for two years, which means you can't play the qualifiers and therefore you can be in the Italy 1990 World Cup. Um, it's a different situation if we had the same type of punishment, uh, because if it's a two year situation that affects all of the teams, uh, then Canada could conceivably not host the World Cup. And here in Canada, we've got a similar situation of influence. There's a vice president of FIFA. He's the, the president of CONCACAF. He lives in West Vancouver, Victor Montaliani. I'm sure that uh, fans of the Canadian program are hoping that he saves them. But again, the precedent that happened in Mexico was that that didn't save Mexico. In fact, the appeals backfired. What was the name of the scandal and what does it mean? They called it the Cachirules. So essentially, uh, Cachirulo was an entertainer who had a show where he always played uh, specific parts designed for young men. So the idea of somebody who's trying to pretend that they're young uh, is, is a word that we use often in Mexico, which is Cachirulo. So th this is essentially what happened. You know, people looking into some of these players uh, who are already in their uh, you know, late twenties uh, and were playing at an under twenty three tournament, uh, which didn't make a lot of sense, of course. Um, the, the Federation was the one that brought this upon themselves when they had this obsession to publish a calendar, uh, sorry, a, a catalog that had all of the data from the players. And that is when they realized that they used the real birth dates for these four players and not the ones that they had registered so they could play on a, in a FIFA tournament. Is the, the questions that need to be answered, especially after the TSN report they indicated it went for years and years and years, how deep did it go and how did this affect the outcome of matches? Did this help Canada qualify for Qatar 2022 on the men's side? Did this help Canada win the gold medal at Tokyo in 2021? 
Um, and will those results be affected or will, as you say, the jeopardy be to the 2026 hosting? I think time is definitely of the essence because, you know, we're uh, less than a couple of years away from figuring out um, how the situation will unfold as far as the hosting of the World Cup, of course. Um, we have to remember what we went through in 1988 after Ben Johnson was uh, stripped of his gold medal. You know, it was a royal commission. There were discussions about how the way Canadian athletes were doing things and and. Uh, it, it was a big thing. Um, so there's, I think there's two ways to go. There's a, there's a, an internal situation, which is going to be Canada based probably. And, and, you know, try to figure out um, how the soccer federation is working and what types of things they've done before. But when it comes to the FIFA punishment, you know, I don't think it's going to be as easy as, as saying, you know, everybody does it and the Canadians got caught. You know, this is, this is probably not going to be enough to appease um, people at FIFA who are definitely dissatisfied with the fact that something like this is happening. And again, I think it'll be um, very important to try to figure out how this plays. Um, women's soccer is in a very different position now than it was back in the late 1980s when Mexico's teams were suspended. And I think we could conceivably have ramifications that that are not only for women's soccer in Canada, but also for the men's team. And I think it all depends on the way FIFA tries to manage this because, you know, we've been talking a lot about integrity. We've been talking a lot about how to make things a little bit better. Uh, we're just coming off uh, a couple of international tournaments where things didn't go particularly well as far as, you know, pitch invaders in Europe and, and the security situation and the boondoggle that was the final in Miami for the Copa America. Uh, so FIFA is going to try to tackle this head on. And the, the only scandals that are comparable really are the new england patriots spygate and the houston astros and their sign stealing both of those involve video didn't involve drones but involve video yet the scandal that has beset the canadian women's olympic soccer team happens on the world scale the world watching thanks for joining us on the podcast this week to talk about this american seiko frequent guest here on the podcast with research co my pleasure anytime now it's time on the breaker.news podcast for around the rim we look at news headlines around the pacific rim in the taiwan news taiwan passport ranks 33rd globally in 2024 taiwanese passport holders can access 141 destinations without a visa Singapore had the most powerful passport for two consecutive years, granting its citizens entry to 195 destinations visa-free. Japan, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain were tied for second place with access to 192 destinations. Canada was eighth with access to 172. In Kyoto news, surge in inbound tourists pushes Japan to explore dual pricing. Some businesses and entities have argued that the dual price system is not meant to rip off visitors but done out of urgent necessity, citing rising labor and other costs as tourist numbers swell. Other foreign tourist destinations that differentiate between locals and visitors include the Diamond Head State Park in Hawaii, where state residents can enter for free while foreign tourists and those from other U.S. states are charged. In the Hong Kong Free Press, Two crypto promoters wanted by Hong Kong police issued Interpol red notices. Wang Ching Kit, 30, is wanted on charges of fraud and theft, while Mok Sun Ting, 26, is wanted over dealing with property known or believed to represent proceeds of indictable offense. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In Willamette Week, the chief petitioner for Initiative Petition 17, which would give $750 to nearly every Oregonian, states his case. Large corporations would pay higher taxes to fund a universal basic income plan. Antonio Gisbert is a former neuroscientist turned organizer and one-time representative for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. In Crosscut, are offshore wind turbines in Washington's future? If voters decide in November to keep the cap and invest program, the state has plans that could bring the technology to its coastal waters. California and Oregon have eight projects in the pipeline. 
Hawaii has two. Officially, Washington has none. It does have two unsolicited proposals that are currently just sitting. And in the Breaker.news, read stories such as sentencing delayed for Vancouver Island environmental protesters and liberal socialite disputes cancellation of her BC insurance license. Read the stories behind the headlines in the Breaker.news. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.news podcast. Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Lakes. July is Lakes Appreciation Month in British Columbia. Appreciate your local lake for its drinking water, fish habitat, energy, or just swimming. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of July 28th, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 28th of July in 1984, the Summer Olympics opened in Los Angeles? The 1984 Games were boycotted by the Soviet Union and its allies in retaliation for the U.S.-led boycott of Moscow 1980. Sixth place Canada won 44 medals, including 10 gold. L.A. hosted first in 1932. It will host again in four years in 2028. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter. It's free and get updates to your inbox. Or follow the Breaker News on X, formerly Twitter, for news as it happens. And you can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash thebreakernews. Until next week.